once this whole this all started, when I took a group from my lab down there for, for a weekend's collecting, brought yeah. my eight-year-old son, and he's in engineering Waterloo now, so that tells you how long ago yeah. that was, right? At that time he was eight, and uh, we saw we saw these wasps flying around. And he said, what are they? And all their, their solitary wasps festivals and stuff. And he said, well, they've got jewel beetles. Really? <laughs> cool. <laughs> and uh, so he knocked one out of the air. And uh, we looked at it. Well, that's pretty cool. Let's collect a bunch of these jewel beetles because maybe there'll be something interesting here. And so we spent half an hour knocking them out of the air, stealing the beetles. And uh, I can't remember. We published a paper. I should look it up. Uh, it was like six new records from Canada for jewel beetles of the depressed species. Based on those collections, Based on the, the, on the collections, collections yeah. that's so awesome. So I brought them back and Pyro and I worked them up and we wrote a nice little paper on it. Yeah. And uh, as I was thinking about it, I thought, well, geez, you know, the EAB has just appeared here. Yeah. And Cause that would have, so that would have been, what, if, like 2005? 12 years ago. Yeah, okay. That's amazing. So it really just had had like it was just what two thousand two that was in, just in just yeah they were just in winter at that point yeah uh, and uh, I thought well this is, this has got some real potential and uh, I, I I wrote it, that paper deliberately not only to, to to cite the new records and to talk about the, the, the new biology yeah. we found in the but also I, I I wanted it specifically to make the case for a possible biosurveillance right. tool because I wanted to use the paper as a platform to look for money. Yeah. And, uh, and that was still years before Phil Carroll, the guy who did the Masters, he had even heard of Sorceress or, or even heard of the Gorillas. Yeah. And so when I wrote that paper, it laid out the possibilities here for using uh, Sorceress for biomonitoring when you we we were not using the term biomonitoring. Yeah. Uh, so I could take that paper and then go with it to CFIA and say, look, I can see you got some money. Yeah. And a document was published in NSAR Canada. What do you think? And fortunately, we had a champion there, Bruce Gill, yeah. and a very successful masters taking this idea of using uh, um, a wasp that had evolved to, to hunt down and, and uh, capture these otherwise elusive beetles uh, and, and do so very effectively and, and much more cost effectively than we could do with you know, the blue cards and sticking traps. And yeah, for sure. Because there's no pheromone that works for, for gorillas. Yeah. So we were stuck. That's pretty cool. It's, I mean, it's, it's a really neat, it's such a neat story, and I love the fact that it came about. I mean, the, the hand action that you did, that was the, that was the collection. Like, it wasn't, it wasn't netting. You could no, see them come back later. They're very slow. They come in there like zeppelins. Yeah. They're flying in. Like, I have four, we can see, I have just a photograph yep. one in the air with a beetle. Yeah. Uh, if, if they come in slow enough, you can actually swing in them with a camera. And, <laughs> and they're, although they have stingers like this one, yeah. big stingers, they look vicious. Uh, my eight-year-old wasn't the least bit concerned because he's been collecting solitary yeah. wasps with me since he was three, yeah. and uh, he knows they don't sting. So he was just knocking them out of the community, <laughs> and, and, and they instantly dropped the beetles and picked them up. And the neat thing about this was it was very timely because Cerceris fume penis, this is this big smoky winged fume penis, big, big wasp. Uh, that's involved here had only been recorded from Ontario for the first time the previous year by Matt Buck, Is my, that my right? associate here yeah, in the lab. Yeah. So I didn't Matt, that. Matt and I had, had collected these things together, but Matt was the expert on specimens, so he wrote and published uh, a new uh, records paper, and he included uh, searchers for human penis in the checklist. So you know, we were working with the wasp that we had just discovered here. A year prior, yeah. and then it's like a year after the discovery, we go. Well, this is a cool way to monitor buprestids. Yeah. We found new buprestids for Canada, as I yeah. said in that first survey. And then it went from that to, well, why not go beyond monitoring for general biodiversity and monitoring for a pest? We actually thought that there might be some possibility it would have enough impact on populations to to have economic value to drive down to drive down populations yeah, yeah. because, of course. As, as one species becomes more abundant, that becomes their search image. Yeah. So if you go to Rondo now, you watch these things in the group camp where there's still hundreds of them. Um, nine out of 10 prey items coming in is EAB, but it's still not enough to knock down the numbers. Right. But it's a super effective monitoring technique. Phil even developed a system where he he had them he moved the colonies up into trailers. Yeah. And he hauled the, tra hauled the trailers and, around, and parked them in spots where we, we didn't know that were a EAB, Took the lids off the, 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 the colonies, opened up the burrows, wasps flew out and came back with EAP an hour later. 
So where where we had failed to find them, where where, where CFIA yeah. and, 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 and Forestry Canada they failed to find them. These Maybe. mobile colonies, yeah. Describe, yeah, they are very, That's very, so cool. Yeah, was was really neat. One of the other neat things in terms of like the what we've been talking about in the class, other expertise at Guelph, but the importance of a particular expertise at Guelph in terms of the collection and the having people in the collection talking about things all the time and the fact that that made it, there was this like perfect intersection of these opportunities, the invasion, but also the perfect opportunities of, of uh, you and Matthias talking about the documentation of the new species and, and that if this isn't here, those opportunities might get missed. That's right. We probably wouldn't have recognized it as first for few penance if Matt hadn't gone out the previous year and done a survey of, of specimens in Ontario. If he had yeah. been really adamant on documenting what was here and working with the identifications. So that was the first step. We, we wouldn't have published that first paper if Steve Pyro hadn't been here with really keen interest in, in the Buprestid identification. Because yeah. I don't have time to sit down and, 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 and identify uh, Buprestid as the species. I mean, I do now because we've written a guidebook that's yeah. fast. But at that time, it was a pretty time-consuming process. Yeah. But Steve had done the, the uh, primary literature review, and we had the reference collection. The reference collection was magnificent. So between those two resources, Steve was able to go, all right, we have these species. And these weren't known to Canada before. Yeah. So this, this now drives the paper. So the paper was actually driven by the new records, yeah. and then we slipped in this bizarre idea of using it for 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 monitoring and surveillance, yeah. which which actually the editors of of uh, Canet were a little leery about because they thought it was very speculative. But but, but the records, was the records, oh, I did that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. of course. I mean, that was one of the main reasons I wanted to get that paper out because I wanted to establish this idea in print so I could then go and look for some money to to test it out. Yeah. Oh, that's so cool. So jewels on the campus, jewel beetles and, and, and that. I think that's just a fantastic um, story. And thanks for talking to them about it. And um, let's see what's good. So for example, uh, you're talking about forest biodiversity. One of the most important groups in in, uh, in forestry is the Cerambicidae, the longhorn beetles, and uh, you know, everybody loves them because there's so many big, spectacular ones. However, the one that, that uh, is getting a lot of attention, everybody's asking about, is this guy here. Um, this is uh, you know what it is, Asian longhorn bird. Yeah. Uh, 